Hi. Hi. I'm glad to be here this morning. Beautiful autumn day. I love this time of year. We used our heater this morning, which was fun. Anyway, we better get right into the word. And I'll put on my glasses, keep the hair out of my eyes, which wouldn't curl today, which is so unimportant. <laughs> Sorry. You can open to the, to, uh, we're in Mark. Open to the book of Mark. We're in chapter two. And these studies have really been great, haven't they? We see Jesus, he's a lover of people, celebrating, well, the first lesson, he was celebrating the wedding. And I was just, it's interesting that Missy suggested that he was the life of the party. I had just never thought of Jesus that way. But then I thought, wherever he was, I mean, his presence must have been big. He must have been wonderful to have at a wedding reception. Then we saw Jesus, he was showing compassion to the, to the woman at the well, how, how, how caring and kind he was. That was a beautiful study. And then feeding the multitudes. And last week, Heather gave us a, a meaningful lesson on the bread of life. I mean, we've really been fed really well thus far. Now today, the ministry of Jesus, it begins to kind of take a turn. We have, he's coming against all kinds of accusations and and uh, criticism from the religious leaders. So in our lesson, we see that Jesus, he's going to challenge the scribes and the Pharisees in their beliefs and their practices and in much of their unspoken skepticism because Jesus, he discerned the thoughts and the intent of the heart even before they could verbalize it many times. Proverbs 27, 19 it says, as a face is reflected in water, so a person is reflected by his or her heart. And this is what our lesson really gets down to today. Jesus looking into the heart of men and women. He still does that today, doesn't he? Jesus has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and he will be forever. And he knows the secrets of people's hearts. Therefore, he can diagnose exactly where a person is in his or her spiritual walk. So as we begin, let's just think about that for a moment. You know, where, what does Jesus see when he looks into your heart, when he looks into my heart this morning? Hopefully he sees a humble, a teachable, non-judgmental heart, a merciful heart for others. Perhaps this morning he discovers a heart that really wants to be more tender and loving, but for some reason easily is turned aside, easily distracted from the Lord. I don't know. Nevertheless, we're all in the right place because no doubt God the Holy Spirit wants to minister to all of us about keeping the main thing the main thing. And the main thing in our Christian life is always Jesus and our relationship with him, right? So let's begin with prayer. Pray the Lord will speak to all of our hearts. Cause us to hear, dear God, what you want to say to us this morning. And Lord, I'm going to pray like David did in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way, any judgmental way, anything that's unpleasing to you, and lead me in the way of everlasting life. Amen. Okay, so as we come into chapter 2, we are in verses 13 through 28 today. We know the fame of Jesus has spread abroad throughout the entire region. There's crowds of people that are flocking to see him for all kinds of reasons. But most were out of sync with what Jesus was really wanting them to understand and to receive. What Jesus wants is for a man or woman to see their need for him as Savior and then Lord of, li of their life to repent and thus to receive his forgiveness and his amazing grace. And this is why he came. He came to usher in the new covenant of grace. He didn't come to continue on with all the old rules and the regulations. And when one understands that, we're in sync 
with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Of course, in the verses we're in today, this is really the problem. These religious leaders of the day, well, they're just too legalistic to receive anything from the Lord. But Jesus is going to speak to them truth, but we'll see it's to no avail. They're just, they're just too righteous. They're just too self-righteous, and that's the bad news for them. But there's good news, too, because we see the call of Levi to leave his old life behind and to begin his new life following after Jesus. So let's start with verse 13. Jesus walked along the seashore, and it says, large crowds, they come to him, and he taught them all. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth collecting taxes. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Levi arose and followed. I think that's interesting that we don't see here any kind of an interview, you know, any special qualifications. Jesus didn't say, you know, you'll be on a trial basis, Levi, for a little while. <laughs> he didn't say anything like that. He just said, Levi, follow, follow me. We do know that later, Levi became known as Matthew, which means gift of God. I mean, how beautiful is that? That's what his name meant. And Matthew became one of the 12, and he wrote the Gospel of Matthew. So Jesus, he must have seen the great potential in Levi. But at this point, when Jesus called him, he was simply a tax collector, a publican, working for the Roman government. And all the commentaries I read said he was despised and he was an outcast in his society. And oddly enough, that made me think of his parents and his grandparents. You know, Levi was from the tribe, uh, he was from the tribe of Levi. And possibly his parents thought he would become a scribe or something important in that day. So I have to assume he was a he, they were disappointed in their son. No parent wants their son to be an outcast in society. Nevertheless, publicans like Levi, they were notoriously dishonest. In fact, I read in ancient Rome, there was actually a monument that was erected to honor one tax collector that was honest. They made a statue out of him. <laughs> All that to say, Levi at this time, he doesn't appear to have anything to offer. But I love that despite his failures, despite his lifestyle, and obviously his sin, Jesus loved him, and Jesus called him to a new life. And at this point, Jesus had already called Andrew, Peter, James, and John. And like these other disciples, when, when uh, he was called, Levi immediately leaves his toll booth and he follows. He's leaving all behind, just like the others. And I, do, I have to wonder just a little bit at these emotional scenes when these disciples were called. What kind of a voice did Jesus use to call the disciples? Was it you know, soft? Was it a quiet voice? Follow me. I like that. Or did he speak, you know, more authoritative, you know, firmly to them? What tone did he use on this earth, really, to cause Levi to leave his life occupation and just walk away and follow? Questions we cannot answer, except to say that's how extraordinary Jesus was and is when he speaks to a heart, when he calls someone to follow him, the results are remarkable. Do you remember? Do you, do you agree? That's how it was for Pastor Al and me when we were called to follow the Lord. It is a night I will never forget. The invitation was given. I just raised my hand so high that night. And then I went forward with my husband. We went forward for prayer. We really both fell in love with Jesus that night. And really, life, God has been working in our lives ever since. It was wonderful. Also, because at the same time at Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, that song that we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. It was so popular. And it was a, a great song. And we would sing that song at church. And we would sing that song with all of our hearts and so loud. You all know it. We sing it still at church, you know, 40 years later, we're still singing it. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. The cross before me, the world's behind me. There's just no turning back. Though none will go with me, still I will follow. There's no turning back. Merely all that to say, it was remarkable when we started to follow Jesus. It's still remarkable. Because I think once we say yes to Jesus, once you say yes to Jesus, all the experiences of your life, I want to say all the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, all the ups and the downs, all the joys, all the sorrows that you experience, I believe they all come under that banner of yes, I have decided to follow Jesus. Again, do you agree with that? Everything that happens in your life. But yes, I have decided to follow Jesus. And you know, I don't think we ever stop learning more about what that decision meant and means. Of course, there's one thing I know it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that from, from now on, our life will just be a pretty bo big bowl of cherries. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that we will never, ever be alone again. Because Jesus has made us that promise. In Hebrews 13, 5, he said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And that's his promise to all who follow him. See, ladies, Jesus called Levi this particular day. But Jesus has called us all, hasn't he, to follow. And I think we can be thankful that that invitation, it continues, it continues to go out today to everyone. And that's why here we hear Pastor Raj each and every Sunday share the gospel and then give men and women the opportunity to give their hearts to Christ because this is a church that continues to seek the lost. And it's wonderful really to pray when he's praying and he's giving that invitation as Christians for us to pray and then we're just part of that, all of that. It's wonderful. So Levi, he's so excited now in verse 15 through 17. He's so excited to follow Jesus that we see that he invites all his friends to the dinner at his house probably so they can meet Jesus. Verse 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in Levi's house, many publicans and sinners sat with him and his disciples, for there were many and they followed. And when the scribes and the Pharisees, they saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said to the disciples, how is it that he eats and drinks with publicans and sinners? Verse 17, and when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. I came, to call the, to, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I love this. First of all, that the Lord doesn't call perfect people <laughs> to follow after him. That's the good news for all of us, right? <laughs> he welcomes sinners and all the common people, those that aren't counted among the religious elite. See, in the minds of these Pharisees, Jesus, his judgment is now coming into play and he's eating with such sinners and all. Even though Jesus had taught with authority all around the region, they listened. They saw what he did. He commanded demons to leave. He healed people. He touched the lepers, performed miracles. He even forgave sin. And I'm sure to some, the, his authority was really without question. Yet, eating with all these sinners... You know, it was just overriding everything. It just could not be understood. Personally, I'm sure glad Jesus preferred the company of sinners. <laughs> Aren't you? That Jesus looked at that unsaved one like he's sick. He's sick in his heart and in need of what he offered forgiveness of all his sins, regardless of who they are or what they had done. And this is the attitude that we all need to have as well. Because Jesus, you know, he has left that door wide open for all the whosoevers, all the whosoevers that will believe. Revelations 22, 17. And the spirit and the bride <clears throat> say, come. Let him that hears come. Let him that is thirsty come. And whosoever 
will let him come and take of the water of life freely. See, that's beautiful because sometimes I know we wonder, will our family, will our friends ever accept that? Will they ever be saved? I don't know. But no one is ever beyond hope. The door has been left wide open for whosoever will follow. And I believe that Jesus sees the heart. He sees the potential also in the lives of the lost. The families that we're praying for that are, you know, every day heavy on our hearts. So we're called. We're called to keep praying and we're called to keep living our changed life before them. And someone wrote, and sometimes we will need to use our words. But I was thinking the Pharisees had, some prob had the same problem as Jonah in the Old Testament. You know, Jonah got upset because God was merciful to the Ninevites. He wanted God to judge them instead. And that's what these Pharisees are like. They have no love. They have no compassion in their heart for others. They have no need to be forgiven, really, of anything because they're just so self-righteous. They're full of religious pride. They're motivated really only by social standings and acceptance, all external things, everything temporal. It's like today, much like today. I think it's harder to reach a self-righteous person, don't you? They think they have no need. It's hard for them to admit that they're a sinner. They're good, and maybe they are. They're better than most. We all know people like this, even in our own families. I mean, that was my experience with my dear mother. And then, of course, there's some that believe they're too sinful, that they're really beyond help. And that was my father. Thankfully, they both did come to Christ, but it was on their deathbeds. But I was thankful for it. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever, all the whosoevers, the whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Again, it's a promise. You know, in the church, in, in the body of Christ, Christians can be legalistic sometimes. They don't even realize it, but it really stands out to most of us. And it hurts the church always. It hurts other people. It, it can make them feel less. It can make them feel um, less important, unloved, judged, for sure. See, legalism will push away the weaker brother or sister, child, teenager in your life. It'll push them out of the church. It'll push them away from the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, we are all ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, see? But the spirit, that is what brings life to people. The letter of the law quenches the spirit. So we all need to be alert about that. We need to be careful because we... The enemy, he hates us. He loves us to find fault with one another. So, just always stay humble and kind. That's a song. It's been on my mind all week. It's a popular song. And that's kind of the chorus. And have any of you heard it? No, I won't see it. <laughs> but obviously, it's a really pretty song. Always stay humble and kind. And I love it. It's a good mindset. But like I said, Jesus didn't come to bring us rules and regulations. He came to love people. He came to set us free because he enjoyed people, didn't he? He even went to cookouts on the beach. He dined with people. He celebrated. He went to banquets. He engaged people. He was good. He was good to people. And Romans 2, 4 says it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. We should remember that. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And that was, I, I love that scripture because that was my experience. 
the goodness of God led me to, to him. Now, I think this is what Jesus is trying to teach when he said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But the religious leaders, well, they just have no words for this, really. So they have to just go on to find more, more fault with Jesus. So verse 18, they say, well, then how about fasting? You know, that's not an innocent question. There was nothing wrong with fasting, but that was an accusation. They were judging his disciples here. And in verse 19 and 20, we have the Lord's beautiful reply. He says, can a wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is still with them? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus said, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast in those days. See, his answer here, it's a beautiful answer, really, but it opens up many, many great truths of which, you know, we don't have time for this morning because that'd be many more Bible studies. But here for today, I do love that Jesus is proclaiming when the disciples are with him, with him, they have no need to fast. See, Jesus knew when they were with him, they had everything, all that they needed. They could be completely fulfilled, completely satisfied in his presence. He's saying being with him is a time to feast, not fast. It's a time to celebrate. But he then says there will come the time when he will be taken from them. And he's referring, of course, to the time of his suffering and his death on the cross, which would be, and it was, a sorrowful time, sorrowful season for the disciples. Of course, this could not be understood at that time. But I love that his comments, you know, they do confirm to us that when we're with Jesus, when we're close with Jesus, we do have all that we need. And it confirms to us, I think, a joyful life the joyful life for the believer that's for today, that's for now, and it's forevermore. See Psalm 1611, he shows us the path of life and in his presence is the fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Okay, so now Jesus goes on. He's moving through this conflict. I may be to avoid any further questions about fasting and he's talking about things that they really can't understand. Instead, he starts giving them a lesson on tailoring and wineskins. That's a subject that every one of them could relate to because it was part of their daily lives. Verse 21, no one sews a, new piece, sews a piece of new cloth on an old garment. See, everyone knew that you couldn't sew a new piece of cloth on an old garment. It wouldn't make the repair. It would just tear, of course, and it wouldn't match. No one puts new wine in old bottles or else the new wine will burst the bottle and the wine will be spilled and the bottle will be marred. New wine must be put into new bottles. So Jesus here, he's simply trying to explain to all these Pharisees, you know, through metaphors about bridegrooms and unshrunk cloth and wineskins that their old traditions, the man-made laws and all cannot contain God's love or God's grace nor can it contain God's purpose or plan in people's lives. Putting patches on our walk with God or filling up our hearts with rules, uh, old wine, it will never work because salvation is not a partial patching up of our life, is it? It's a whole new robe of righteousness from God because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, they are new. They're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And this, of course, is our born again experience, ladies. No more bound to the old life. We have been made new. Old has passed. The new has come. And even though there are times we have battles within, things happen. We can struggle. We are always still new creatures, made new in Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, 6 says, he has begun a good work in us and will continue to perfect it until he comes again. 
God is just always working in our lives. See, ladies, this is our new life. So for us as Christian women, there is no room for legalism, for self-righteousness. We really need to live in sharp contrast to these scribes and these Pharisees. We have God's living word. We know we can read and study how we are to treat people, how we are to feel about others, saved and, and unsaved alike. I know my husband has always exhorted me, lean on the side of love and you will never go wrong. And see, that's still a good word for me. It's a good word for all of us. Now, the chapter ends with, I'd like to say, everyone just believing and deciding to follow after Jesus. But, of course, that is not the case. We end this chapter, and Jesus is being accused now of breaking the Sabbath law, which he did. He did break them. He had to break them. Verse 23 through 28. It was this particular Sabbath. Jesus was walking through the fields with his disciples, permitting them to pluck the grain, rub it between their hands, and then they'd kind of just blow away the chaff and they'd eat the seeds and the nuts. This, of course, was not illegal to do if you were hungry, but the scandal was that it was the Sabbath. And Pastor Raj recently has shared with us about the Pharisees and the Jewish traditions and the laws and all. And I wrote down that he said there were 613 in the Old Testament, maybe more, and some 39 categories of acts that were strictly forbidden. And then, they, see, they got carried away with adding more and more regulations to these different categories. It's actually still like that today in many respects. For example, if you visit Israel on the Sabbath, you'll notice it immediately from sundown to sundown. Everything shuts down. Even in the hotels, everything is different. All the meals are pre-made the day before, and elevators are segregated because religious Jews are not allowed to push the buttons. I remember once visiting Israel, and it was dinner time, and Al and some friends were all waiting for me in the lobby. We were going to dinner. I accidentally, accidentally got in this, you know, this, the Shabbat elevator, and it was filled with people. It stopped on every single floor, and we'd wait while the doors opened. We'd wait while the doors closed. Go to the next floor. We'd wait. No one ever got in or out. And since I had gotten in on the 18th floor, it just <laughs> took forever. When I finally got to the lobby, I said, where have you been? I said, I've been in the elevator. <laughs> in short, the Sabbath day had become a burden of religious rules. Of course, originally, God simply wanted them to take a day of rest from all of their work and all of their labor, which was a good thing. So I was thinking, for us as Christians, in a way, every day, is Sabbath for us because we have entered into God's rest because we believe the gospel and we believe and we rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's why in the New Testament, Christians are never commanded to keep the Sabbath, not in the Old Testament or in any of the epistles. In fact, it's the only one of the Ten Commandments that's not reaffirmed in the New Testament. So. We see Jesus, he declares to them all in our last verse that he is Lord. He is Lord even over the Sabbath. And in other words, I believe Jesus is summing this up by telling them something I'm thankful everyone in this sanctuary, I'm assuming, understands. That he, that it is far better, far better, far more important to know him to have a personal relationship with him than to think you're religious or to have to keep a lot of rules. See, Jesus is making the main thing the main thing. So prayerfully, this lesson has challenged you and me to examine our own hearts. And if nothing else, I know that we've benefited from learning about these uh, religious leaders in that we certainly don't want to be anything like them. 
do we? Jesus did tell a parable in Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the tax collector. Both had gone to the temple to pray. The tax collector stood with his head bowed and he's crying for mercy. The Pharisee prayed, however, first of all, the list of all the wonderful and marvelous things that he had done. And then he prayed a list of all the people that he considered himself much, much better than, including this tax collector. So the lesson is so clear. The self-righteous man completely misses the heart of God. One considered himself religious, and the other considered himself a sinner. I trust we are all represented by the sinner, the one who Jesus forgives, the one who is a sinner yet saved by grace. Amen? So I'm going to close with this final thought. What's the big difference between a legalistic Christian and a grace-filled Christian? Yes, always be humble and kind. It's a pretty song. But I'm going to zero in right here on mercy because it's such a beautiful word. And I don't think I can never hear enough about mercy. Pastor Raj even talked about it on Sunday. And he said, mercy is compassion in action. He said, so keep on becoming more and more and more merciful. And I love that. And when I was praying over this message, and I felt I wanted to close talking about mercy, Mike, Micah 6.8 came to mind. Micah 6.8 says, what does the Lord require of you but to love mercy, to do justly, and to walk humbly with God? It's a short verse, but the phrase, love, mercy, that's kind of powerful. Not just have mercy, you know, but love mercy. Michael is telling us as women to fall in love with it. What's it mean to fall in love with mercy? I think it means that you love everything about it. I love the way it applies to me. I love the way it applies to you. And we love the way it applies to everyone else around us, all the whosoevers that will come and follow someday. In short, with mercy, where, without mercy, where would any of us be? That's why we're all going to heaven, God's mercy. So having received mercy from God, I will love wearing glasses, lens of mercy. You know, I'll view others through that kind of a lens including our husbands, ladies, for those of you that are married. Why? Because mercy lies at the very heart of our God. And it is sincere. It's tender. It, it is intense in a way, but it's warm and it's affectionate. Mercy is a wonderful characteristic of our Lord, who we all seek to be like. So how opposite is that from being a legalistic Christian? So if you remember nothing else from this morning, remember Micah 6.8. Let's love mercy, do justly, and walk humbly with God. And if you find yourself lacking mercy, just take a moment to refocus on Jesus, the main thing in your Christian life, and the one who will enable you to be a merciful woman. Now, I really will end with this. It's just the sweetest practical application of mercy that I read. A husband got in an accident while driving his wife's brand new car. He felt understandably upset, fretting about what she would say and do when she found out. I guess she had no mercy. As he retrieved the insurance papers from the glove compartment, he found this note in his wife's handwriting. Dear Bob, when you need these papers, remember, it's you I love, not the car. Aww. See, James 2.13, show mercy because mercy rejoices against judgment. Let's pray.